Hello, everybody. Welcome to our brand new Youth Only Academy Challenge. Now, these are quite common on Foot Manager across uh, content creators, and not just content creators, but people doing these kind of saves. I myself personally have never done one of these series, either for content or off camera, way before I even did content, ever in my Foot Manager slash Championship Manager life. Never done it before. And as you can see from the, well, the title of the series, as you can see right now, we're going to be doing it with Burton Albion. Now, first question would be, okay, why Burton? Doesn't really seem like a a choice people would normally go for. They either go for a team, maybe right at the bottom of the pyramid or, or something to that nature, right? And the second part to this series, you're going to be thinking about what, what is the England DNA? Some of you may know what it is, some of you may not. Um, so we're going to get into that right now. So why Burton Albion? So Burton Albion playing League One. Now, you may notice something a bit unusual if I was to click on facilities, for example. So, Burn Albion, all looks pretty good as you work your way down the list. And all of a sudden, see training facilities, state-of-the-art training facilities, youth facilities, state-of-the-art youth facilities. Now, why is that? And the reason for that is they train, as you can see right here, they train at St. George's Park. Now, St. George's Park is the big national football centre that they created. It's more than just a training ground. It's a bit more than just that. But it's, uh, yeah, I think they've, they've got it written here, right? The national football centre, there you go. That's what it's written as in the game, um, where obviously the, the national men's, I think women's team train at the, uh, St. George's Park and everybody else, all the youth teams in England, they all train. Everything's based at one location. That's the whole point of it, or one of the many points of it anyway. And yeah, Burton, Burton trained there. And the reason for that is, one, they're the closest club, I think, to it. And they've got some sort of agreement with the FA that they're able to, which I think is really good, actually, to be honest. And it's not that I wanted to have a team with great facilities from the get-go. Um, I wasn't too bothered about that, to be honest with you. I just thought this would be a really good way to combine my coaching background, you know, being a UAPB licensed coach in real life and having worked at an academy. And I've actually been to St. George's Park as well as part of a, of a coaching event, let's say. So um, yeah, I thought, why not have, why not have one great opportunity to blend my background with my, I guess, current foreground? I thought, well, what better way to, uh, to blend my coaching background with what I do at the moment, which is obviously working at SI, but doing content and for manager specifically, in that content. So I just thought, why not? That sounds like a perfect combination to do it. So I thought, yeah, let's uh, let's give that a go. So this video you're going to see already, obviously I don't know it yet, but you, you see it right now, is going to be broken up into chapters. So there's going to be a bit of this video is going to be a bit of the background on what St. George's Park is a little bit, but we've sort of covered that really. It's not too much to go into detail there. But explaining what the England DNA is, because I think that's going to play quite a big role in what we do. And it might be a bit of an educational uh, tutorial and a bit of video for those of you that aren't aware. And um, I guess if you haven't really done coaching courses, you wouldn't really have heard about this too much. So a good opportunity to explain to you what that is and why English development, English football development has changed so much over the last, what, seven, eight years or so. Okay, so what is the England DNA? So let's just go through this a little bit here and let's cast your mind back to 2014. So that's when the England DNA was actually announced. But obviously it would have been in, in the works a few years prior to that. So 2014, England had had one of the worst World Cups for quite a long time. Not in terms of just results, but like expectation and the way that they played and, and all that kind of stuff, right? And um, I think the general feeling was that we'd underperformed for quite a long time as a, as a, as a country. Although, I mean... The thing is, we always think that England team has so many great players, especially like when you think about Gerard Lampard and all the, that team, Beckham, Scholes, etc. I think one thing that we sometimes forget, that although we had all those great players at that one time, Brazil also had Roberto Carlos, Rivaldo, Ronaldo, you know, Lucio, when he was prime Ronaldinho, and the rest, right? So I think there's always a bit of that we need to always preface it with. But I think what became the thought was that we didn't really have a plan as a nation of how we we're going to develop players. We were sort of relying on the Premier League's popularity and the, the big clubs to sort of carry through the development of the of the youth players, which was working to a point. Um, but I think whenever you see nations have teams that dominate the Champions League, not in just in terms of winning it, but getting to the final a lot, that normally translates into a big international performance at some point. Like if you were to take... Uh, Spain, obviously in 2008, winning the Euros, World Cup in 2010, and Euros again in, in 2012. Around that period, you had Pep Guardiola's Barcelona, and, uh, and Real Madrid also doing really well just before that period, and then again towards the back end of it, right? So we never really had that ourselves, despite the fact that, like, if you were to look at, um, it was a good example, if you were to look at the, the mid-2000s onwards, right? So 2005 to 2012, 
England had either one or two teams in the Champions League final every year, except for one. So 2005, Liverpool. 2006 was Arsenal. 2007 was Liverpool. 2008 was Chelsea versus United. Uh, 2009 was United. 2010 was the only year we didn't have one because it was Inter versus Bayern. 2011 was was Barca versus United. And 2012, Chelsea uh, won it against Bayern. So, so from 2005 to 2012, there was an English team in every single Champions League final, except for one. You know, and we won it quite a few times as a, as a if you want to look at it as a nation. I'm, I say weeks, but I'm looking at it from how they would have perceived it, right? You'd have to be English to be a part of like what I'm explaining here. I'm just trying to explain how it was viewed, right? So thought process was um, the French, the Germans, the Dutch, the Spanish, everybody has a, a clear pathway of how they like to do things. And it's not, ju- and this is a big thing, right? Philosophy does not just mean playing style. That's one aspect of a philosophy. It's coaching philosophy. I think they go into scout and identification philosophy. There's other areas to a philosophy than just how your team plays. But there was a clear philosophy at every other nation, except for ours. We didn't seem to really have anything going. Um, obviously, there's the old school tradition of English teams were direct. They had two strikers, uh, high tempo, lots of hard tackling, good on set pieces. There are things that we attributed to English football, but that wasn't necessarily a deliberate identity of, of England, right? That wasn't set from the FA down. It's just something that happened in the way that football sort of developed into, into our country. So what you can see here first thing we're going to look at is anybody that's done a coaching course, even, even prior to the England DNA, the English FA introduced something called a four-corner model. So what that means here in this corner, you can see technical and tactical, psychological, physical, social, right? Now, every session that a coach designs is broken down to those four corners. So every player is broken down into these four corners and every session is broken down to these four corners uh, in England anyway. I think UEFA wide, it's something similar to this. Every country has something very similar. It's always around these things, right? Technical and tactical could be two different categories, to be honest, but I think it's just these have a four corner model and they do blend quite a lot together, right? Because the technique that you might need for finishing might depend on how you're getting deliveries uh, from your team and the chances, the type of chances your team creates, right? So that's where it's linked to tactical. But for me personally, I've always found as well that psychological and tactical and psychological and social can also have elements of, of them, right? Basically, the whole point is they all blend anyway. That's why you incorporate all of them. I don't want to go down too much into detail. I'm just trying to explain to you sort of where we're going with this and how this is going to look. So as you can see here, Thursday, the 4th of December, 2014, England unveiled the DNA philosophy at St. George's Park. Also, the 4th of December happens to be my birthday. So could be an important connection going forwards. Yeah, I'm not going to break this all down for you right this second because a lot of stuff there, stuff that we don't need to go through right this second. But if I was to explain to you what is the England DNA in short... So as you can see here, just going to read the top by the England DNA is the playing and coaching philosophy of the England teams. Again, going back to what you said before, a philosophy isn't just your playing philosophy. It goes into other areas and they're saying the coaching philosophy as well. The long term aim of the England DNA is to help create winning senior teams in the men's and women's game. So in a snapshot, that's what it is, right? And it's broken into core elements here. There's five of them, I believe. Yeah, there's five. So just going to go through, we'll just go through the, the names of them right this second. So it's who we are, how we play, the future England player, how we coach, and how we support the process. So you can see here, that's quite a detailed thing. And you, they go through all the, the four corners, they split them to five there as well. But you can see now how all of a sudden there's a much closer framework and there's an identity across multiple areas of how the players can be developed in England. And it's not just at the absolute senior level, right? Like if you were to go and do a coaching course in England, you'd get taught all of these things, right? Especially at level two and then going into the B license, you get taught all of these things. So it's not just about when they get to the England standards, trying to apply these values and create these players in the in this mold then, but it's about making sure that they've had it encouraged to them at the very grassroots where most players start, right? Nobody... But like very rarely do players walk straight into an academy. Maybe if you're the son of a former player, something like that, most players go into grassroots first and at some point they end up in an academy. Traditionally, that's how it ends up. Obviously, there's the odd one like Jimmy Vardy who doesn't. But, you know, generally speaking, that's how players end up in the professional game and end up in the England setup in some form. So it's not just about the elite level, but also the, making sure the grassroots is aligned. You're making sure that everything's aligned. Everything's aligned under one banner, one idea, but the important thing is it's not too specific and restrictive of a, of a philosophy. That's, I think, what's really important when we go through to the next bit. So the DNA connection, playing philosophy, talent ID philosophy, coaching and learning philosophy and performance support philosophy. So again, there's the four, they've got four philosophies there across the, uh, the DNA. 
And the purpose was, I guess, if you look through this, the main thing was consistently across teams and trying to create something that was that was English. What represents to be an English football player, an English football team, at least in the modern form? And I would say that because this started in 2014 and was implemented around then, I think they've got a graph at some point showing it's like a five-year period of where they've tried to allow it to develop. So somebody like Phil Foden, anybody, Phil, Phil Foden's probably one of the first players to have like, to be impacted, I think, by this. So anybody older than a Phil Foden probably wouldn't have really had the benefits of this. Something that I think the Sports Interactive did a really good job of with Football Manager a few years ago was, you know, again, going back to anybody that does a coaching course will understand that you have to break your team down into mainly four areas, right? Your your playing philosophy, um, anyway, has to be broken into four areas. In possession, out of possession, transition, into out and out to in, and then your, and then your system of play, your formation, you don't want to be restrictive into one. Obviously, the whole point is to be adaptable. And that's something that the England DNA sort of stresses. The whole point of it as well isn't to, to coach team to play a specific way in a specific system, but to have the players be adaptable, be able to make decisions, right? And that's quite an emphasized part of it. So in possession philosophy statement, so you can just see England teams aim to the intelligently dominate possession, select the right moments to progress the play and penetrate the opposition. I mean... Does it sound generic? A little bit, <laughs> I suppose. Like most teams are going to want to do this at some point, but it, at least that has something that it wants to showcase of like, there is an identity, this is what we want to try and do. We aren't necessarily going to completely implement a full tactical recreation of, of the England DNA because it's a bit more complex and it's 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 quite fluid in systems and we're probably going to stick to... Well, do you know what? It depends, doesn't it? Because it's a youth-only challenge, depending on what sort of players we get through and what positions they play and we could switch the system up... But the philosophy, so for us, the team instructions in foot manager speak, I guess, in foot manager terms, in foot manager terms, our philosophy, our playing philosophy, the team instructions for in possession, out of possession and transition are really going to change. The formation might, because we might end up with, I don't know, we might end up with, I don't know, three like wonder kid strikers. And if I'm playing a two striker system and none of them are really going to do a job on the wing, do I try and shoehorn them into like a 10 roll? You know, how do I get three players into the into the team? So I might have to be creative about my system to make sure we do get three players of the same position to the same team. But I have an idea at the moment of what I want to play, but that could change. But the philosophy won't, but the system might. One of the big emphasis was on goalkeepers. And I guess in 2014, that point, we've just seen uh, Pep Guardiola's teams and Neuer at Bayern showcase why the goalkeeper is so essential to modern uh, systems uh, more than for 2014 anyway because everybody does it now but but to have a goalkeeper that one can play out from the back and two be an effective part of the in possession and building structure in particular in your first in your your defending third but in your own third right so the whole point here is we're looking to make sure the goalkeeper is involved a lot so we're going to try and use a, a super keeper i guess that would mean for us in foot manager terms i guess the biggest thing we're trying to get away from this is we're no longer a 10 plus one we're not 10 out for players just the goalkeeper we're 11 players and the goalkeeper should be involved as much as everybody else in all aspects of in possession. Maybe not creating and scoring, but the other parts. Our possession philosophy statement. England teams aim to intelligently regain possession as early and efficiently as possible. So just stopping it right there. So it's not just as early as possible, because as early as possible would be just blitz them, press them, counter press, just force, force, force. They pay in behind. So what? It's about being intelligent and, and making it as early as possible, but efficiently. So if you're playing a team that's extremely good at playing through the press, maybe you wouldn't just go gung-ho and press as high as humanly possible. You might have to be a bit more fluid about where you set your line of engagement in that context, right? And it goes on to say, taking consideration the state of the game, obviously that would be very important. You don't want to be doing it 1-0 up in a game where it's been very tight and you're going to gift them opportunities and pockets to play through. Uh, state of the game, the environment, and the predetermined game plan. Pre uh, exactly, there you go. The predetermined, the predetermined game plan. So it... It's, it's a bit too loose to say this is the way we're going to apply 24-7, whoever we play whenever. You've got to make sure you have it set to the team you're playing against as well, right? You can have your own identity, you can have your own playing style, but be prepared that you might need to tweak elements of it. You're not going to change who you are overnight, but maybe little tweaks here and then. It's just saying that, that there's room to maneuver it within that, right? You don't want to be just rigid. I mean, this is pretty, pretty common stuff. Um, I, I think the one aspect that we don't really talk about as FM players is... Delay when defending. Delay is a very important principle of defending, I would say. Like, so a good example of those that may not that may not give them an image in the head of what that might look like. Imagine, imagine you've turned over the ball, you're attacking, you've lost it, they played down to the winger, and you've got your two centre backs are back against the winger and a striker for them. So the winger's really fast, right? So 
if your defender goes running at him, in real life in particular, and just goes and engages him, if he gets beaten, that's a 2v1, that's going to be a goal-scoring opportunity. You don't want to get too tight, right? So what's that, what is that defender's primary responsibility? Is it to win the ball? Now, this comes down to your philosophy as a coach, right? What is your playing philosophy? What do you want to see? But delay is a very important concept of defending. So it might be something like a Maldini may think, I'm not going to go win this ball off him because the risk is too high. But all I need to do is get myself between him and the goal and slow him down and make him take as much time as possible because every second he takes now to get closer to the goal, we've got recovering defenders. We've got recovering midfield players. And by the time they exploit, try to exploit us, we could be a much better set to defend where, you know, if we'd have got engaged immediately, we'd be just risking giving up a clear, clear opportunity, right? I don't think that many of us appreciate that in FM as much, the delay concept. It's like, yeah, just go, go and hit him as hard as you can, tackle him. We'll try and win it, try and win it off him, right? And that not everything should be a moment of winning the ball. It should always sometimes be just delay, delay and force. Delay, 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 force him back, force him backwards. If you can force him backwards in a moment like that, you've won, you know? And there are sessions you can do around that where the primary focus is, is first of all, can you delay and force it backwards? And then if he tries to take you on and he does get the shot away, try and figure out why that happened, what, what you did to allow that to happen. But your primary focus isn't winning the ball off the player. It's can you force him backwards, right? So that's that's delay. And I think that it's an important part that, that we don't really do in FM much as, as players. Most of us like just go and press win the ball. So yeah, I just thought I'd mention that. The transition philosophy statement. England team sense changing moments in the game, both in and out of possession, reacting instinctively and intelligently. Sounds good. How do you coach that? How do you teach your team to do that? That's going to be a, a discussion for either later in the series or we can go into a different time in a, maybe in a kind of stream or something. But yeah, that's the philosophy for, for transition. So yeah, transition here is interesting. So you've got in possession, transition into outs. So that would be you've, you've got the ball, you've now lost it, now you're out. So what transition period here, what do you do? You're out of possession and you've just won it. Now what do you do? So in FM terms, that would be your selecting counter attack or hold shape and counter press and regroup, right? That's where your transition would come in. So recognition of the game situation and game state is the first and most important thing what they're saying here. It's not just about having just one instruction that does all for us in FM. It's more like there's 10 minutes to go and we've just won the ball. What do we want to do with it? Now, maybe we like to counter and that's our preferred style, but in FM, that's going to potentially risk you throwing players forward to the that maybe you don't really want that scenario. So maybe it's about we untick counter. Maybe it's that when we when we lose the ball, instead of counter pressing, we now regroup. Something like that. But first and foremost, making sure that the game situation is is what is what's important. But that's what that's what they're saying here in the in the sub transition model. Now, this is what I wanted to get to really was the the playing stuff. I just wanted to show you what that was because we we'll, we'll touch a bit on it. But the the important thing for us is player development. We are looking at player development in this save. And that's where we're going to use the England DNA a little bit. So formation statement, England teams will play with tactical flexibility influenced by the profile of the players and the requirements of the match or competition. So what that is saying explicitly there is don't just pick a tactic and stick to it. You know, your like, oh, formation stick to it. It's got to be the profile of the players and comments to the match or competition. It, so that's what it's saying. It's, it's having a clear identity of how you want to play and how you want to progress players, but being flexible within the situation. I think that the England team of the last few years has probably shown that a little bit with different formations and systems being played, but always within the same, what felt like the same structure and plan, as it were, right? Coaching slash training strategy philosophy statement. We aim to create the best practice environment possible in all areas to prepare uh, our players and teams for success. And it just sort of goes into plan to review, which is your planning session. You do it, then you review it. A lot of people don't do this bit, but you should. Um, and yeah, going in, so just we're going to go through all this, but the big thing here is work value and work equally across the FA four corner model, which is what we looked at right at the start of the of the episode here. So how we support, so it says here, a range of special disciplines across the teams, medical, scientific, analytical, and psychological. So we can, in FM, do probably three of those things. I don't think we can do too much about this one because we can't speak to the players properly, obviously, like we would in real life. But we can look at analysis. We can scientifically look at look data, things like that. We can always look at the medical um, data that they're giving us and the opinions they're giving us on, on injury risk, that type of nature, right? Right, so we just have a comprehensive look there at the England DNA. And like, there's other aspects we could look at, but taking from that, there's quite a few statements that could that could probably be quite generic and leave it open-ended to some people with what they're what they're looking at, especially in FM. So we have two questions there. One, how does that look for us? And two, how are we going to implement that within the manager, which is what we're here to try and do? 
Right, so the question becomes, okay, how do you then put this into Foot Manager? I've had a look at the training and the, the, the team training, and I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this one week set up here. So this is going to be for any time we have a full week, and only one match on a Saturday and Saturday, for example. So whenever there's a week between games, I'm going to put my England DNA schedule in, which is basically what we're going to cover both attacking and defending uh, set pieces, physical. So we're going to try and incorporate the whole full corner model, model, right? And I want it to be more intense at the start of the week at the earlier part. So you ideally you'd want like a recovery here, like on the Monday, but they have the whole Sunday off anyway. So that's really going to be their recovery. So, so what's going to happen is on the Monday, the first session, the overall team one, that would be like a debrief probably of the game, a bit of analysis on the game that you just had from the Sunday. On the Sunday, the analysis team would have been putting together, I guess a little review of the of the previous match. And also they're going to be, you know, studying the next opponent at the same time. So you go through like a little debrief here of, of the previous match. When we go out there and do some light stuff, work on a couple of things that, you know, if you wanted to work on, because we don't know week to week what that really would be. We're just going to put overall. But in real life, that would be like, I don't know, but we do a session, we do like a, a maybe it's like a Lemby 11 kind of session and you're working on just the back line with a couple of things. Something, something like that you can do it, at the uh, the tempo that you want it to be, so you can sort of like ease them in. You don't want them to do too much intensity, too much high intensity stuff straight after, or two days after the match. Um, in a, in a when you've got ideally got a week between matches, right? Then we do attacking corner, something that again isn't too heavy on the legs, and uh, because we've sort of got two sort of lighter ones, then we go with a bit of endurance and get that in them. And the next day, the match athletes, that'd be like a full on review of well, so that that would be like a full on preview of the next opponent. On the Tuesday here, we do a complete preview of the next team we're going to play. Um, and then maybe that would then transition to a bit of grass work as well. It wouldn't just be a classroom session. It could be out there as well. And then to finish things to to finish out the day. So we're going to get our big intensity into them, into the Tuesday. And our physical corner is going to be covered here. On the Wednesday, you're going to get our attacking day. Basically, we need mainly focusing on the attackers, but we'd have our other coaches working on the defenders and the defending. Each player that was an academy level in particular, each player would have their long-term development plan. So there'd be something specific that they need to work on, which if they're on the opposition, for example, called blended coach and blended practice, you'd have the other coaches working with them on those things. So it's not just the fact that you are working on attackers doing attacking things. Other players going to get bits out of it as well. But that will be like our attacking day we're going to go for here. And again, this isn't really necessarily how I would do it in real life. It's, it's more a case of trying to apply a real life schedule into how I think the game will, will will react to it best, if you see what I mean. That's sort of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to adjust the real-life schedule into the game and how it's going to develop and work, right? Then on a Thursday, we're just going to go all defending. It's ground defense, defending engage and aerial defense. Um, and then Friday, stop a bit of a defensive shape, mini because you've just done that for the day before. Then the attacking movement and defensive corners there. I just had to get the corners in somewhere. And I think that You'd want the defensive corners to be more fresh in their mind than the attacking corners. But of course, if you were doing defending corners here, you'd be recapping the stuff you did at the start of the week with the attacking corners. So you do a bit of both. And why that's pretty good is these two sessions here have got a direct impact on the game, upcoming match, it says here. So, you know, these two sessions here are going to have an impact going straight into the game the next day. So we're going to go with a bit of that. And we're just going to see how that goes. Now, the reason I'm only doing this for a full week is to try and create and shoehorn this into a a schedule where there's two matches shoehorned in or maybe there's a game on the Saturday and a game on the Tuesday or the Wednesday. Like the game is going to move about when you get into Europe, right? And it's when you have two games in a week, they're not always going to be the same days. I just think in those situations, if we let the assistant just take over and he'll rebalance it out and get them to do most things. I think him just rebalancing out will be enough for us to be honest. But as long as those weeks where we get a week between each game, if we can get our training schedule for our DNA into the players there, I think that will that will be good. And you're going to see why I've gone attacking wings in a second here. But uh, in terms of team training, that's what we're going to do. Now we're going to move on to how it's really going to work properly with individual training. Now, individual training, for me, is going to be where we create the single DNA the best and where we create the players and create identities in the players the best, I think, from our individual training. That's where we're going to... That's where they say it's going to be won or lost, I think. Right, so this is going to be the tactic that we are going to use. Now, it may look a little bit obscure. Effectively, just think of it like a like a 3-5-2 with a 10 and two strikers. So think of it like that. I'll go into, I think, loads more tactical detail at some point. But for now, all we're looking at is the reason why he's offset is that now when the ball gets built up on the right-hand side with these three players here, if he was in the middle, 
he would drag probably a player over with him. We'd be marked by a player. And also they would see him as a passing option. So sometimes they would like to try and use him and he'd almost get in the way of our of our attack. So what I like to think of it is like this, like this is our sort of like exploit side. So this side here of the pitch on the right hand side is, is more direct than on the left side. We're looking to get at the opposition quicker. We're looking to play quicker, play more direct and generally have a higher tempo in the way that we play. Go long in behind to the quick striker. That's going to be our quicker striker here. It allows us to create like specific identities for specific players on this side, which I just think it balances it out well. And the left side, on the contrary to that, because you've got the number 10 sort of offset to the side uh, for a lot of the attacks, they're going to look to progress through to him more. Like he's going to be a passing option a lot more often from like the left back, for example. There's a lot more of a potential for him to get on the ball and for him to like sort of be able to link up with the striker. And the reason I've done this is I found that if I was to put him in the middle, and this was like our our bigger striker, like a like a target man type striker, is there'd still be times where he gets played in behind or it gets played in for him into space and the ball just goes in behind and comes back the other way. But having the shadow striker there, sometimes what happens is he's going to then like be offset into the middle. Then what happens is when the left wing back, for example, plays it wide, the shadow striker actually goes out and gets it and leaves completely leaves his marker and is able to get the ball. And quite simply... It's just a way to create a fluid front three where it can line up as a as a, as a two in one. It sometimes might end up in that sort of shape like that, both in and out of possession. Uh, sometimes it might end up but like that at some point. It's just a way for us to create a fluid front three, both in possession and out of possession, and also try and have a more creating side and a more direct exploit side, right? You know, so that that's generally the gist of it. That's why he's offset to the left. It doesn't mean that he won't come over here. There'll be times where he ends up floating over to the middle that he might even end up over here and getting on the ball. It just means that more often than not, he'll be out of the way. So this side can be a lot more direct. Where it breaks down is out of possession sometimes that there's a big gap in here so they can exploit this gap. So you can't have everything in FM at times. So that's what we're going to give up. We're going to give up that for the odds, the odd time it, it breaks down. Okay then, so let's get to my playing philosophy, like generally speaking here. So generally speaking, I want my players in possession to be able to play against any setup with minimal change to our, to our tactics, as it were. So in terms of FM. So let's get to our playing philosophy in possession in particular. So I want my team to be able to have a, a varied passing style, in, in essence, so that no matter how a team sets up, we are, we are capable and comfortable you know, passing and retaining the ball in our own third to invite the pressure on, to go direct if we need to, if they want to press us high and play through the thirds. Obviously, I can't ask players to do things as specifically as I'd like to in real life in the game, but I've created a system where I think we can get enough players in different positions in the, in the match engine where we'll be able to do that. Like always having these two ready up there on attack duties gives us the chance to always go direct. Yeah, we then got our back three with our sort of four players in front of them with the two wing backs and the two pivot players, which gives us seven. So we should be able to build at times with seven players. So we should also be able to keep a numerical superiority when we're trying to play out from the back in the match in particular. So I feel like we should have that as well. I'll be able to progress through the lines. I think that as long as this player is, is able to get higher, if we retain the ball long enough, he should be able to get a bit higher, but that will balance him in the shadow striker off. Wing backs get high and wide. It should give us enough of a structure to have us play through the lines as well. We may be a little possession-based then too direct at times. We might be a bit too much on the two extremes with the way that the match engine plays, but we'll see. We'll find out how it sort of plays up together. So the actual settings on attacking mentality, we're going to keep the width down the middle because I don't want the, I guess, strikers and forwards in particular to all be going too wide. And I don't want the wing backs to be absolutely on the touchline at all times. It may be that, for example, that the... If, this, if the box-to-boxer -box is, or Segunda Valente, as it's going to be called in the game, if he's sort of like up here in a position, it may be that the wing-back could want to be slightly narrower. And I want, to, I want us to focus our attack slightly more down the middle as well. I don't want us to just be, get out to the wing-back, and then he's going to cross it in. It could be that, for example, I want the wing-back to get the ball high and wide, and that then I want the, the central field to be quite central so that I can three-ball him, that he can then go and exploit in a central zone in this sort of area here, rather than if it was maximum width he might end up being more towards this area i don't really want him in the half space this one in particular i want him slightly more central because that striker is going to be threatening in behind anyway so that's sort of the idea there and attacking means we're going to be fairly wide anyway right passing the space so that if we get the ball we see the option if if the option's on if the furthest player forward is on play it so if it goes to the wing back and the striker's on the last defender and he's ready to run through and he's set and it all looks good 
play it. Why not? And if you play it a couple of times and he starts to force the defenders to drop, hopefully then this would make the, the CDM, on the right CDM here, the Segunda Valante, then have space to exploit right as well. So to avoid us going too direct too early, we've got both play out of defense and focus support down left and right because I don't mind us going to the wing backs. And if we do go to the wing backs though early in the build up, what's really important then is that they're going to have to be really good dribblers. And the reason for that is in FM, if we get the ball to the wing back, let's say here, quite often in the, early in the build-up, there's a really good chance in this system that the way that the front three, it's called the front three, are going to occupy the defense, defensive field players, and maybe the fullback, depending on how wide they go. The, the wing back is going to probably be 1v1 quite a lot, I would expect, especially if the opposition winger is going to press our back three. So we're going over the back three, trying to get the wingers to press us, which leaves our wing back 1v1 against their fullback. Now, if our wing backs can be just good enough defensively, but be good going forwards, being good in 1v1 scenarios, then I think we've got the perfect blend. So I'd rather have a winger type player and convert them back than to teach a fullback to then have to dribble and cross. And I think it's easy to do that in real life anyway, which I think is the old, the old saying from one of the famous coaches. Cambridge coach said it now. It may have been Cruyff. I'm not entirely sure. I think the quote is something to the effect of, I can teach an attacker to defend. I cannot teach a defender to attack. Talking about the highest level, like, you know, you could teach a a attacking winger to play a wingback or fullback role, but you couldn't teach a centre-back to go and be a winger because the, the the intangibles that you need and the qualities you need are, are completely different, right? So that's the sort of philosophy I'm taking to the wingbacks in this in this scenario. And I sort of blend this with the next bit of our philosophy, run at defence, because if, it, if we do get in that 1v1 scenario, I want them to exploit it and try and take them on. Um, and if they can't, I'm happy for them to whip in the crosses early. And I put whipped because... Because we're going to have two different types of strikers. They're not going to always whip it. They're going to sometimes play it in the air to the back post anyway, I think, especially from this side. But it just means that they can look to pick out not only the two strikers, but it then brings the little shadow striker into play a little bit as well. Um, that's the idea behind that. And I've gone slightly more direct and much higher tempo. Now, the reason for that is if you have three centre-backs and two CDMs, I do find at times they can be a bit too pass-heavy amongst each other. And it's just to make sure they don't really get caught too much and building up the possession too much because ultimately... If we get a 3v4 even, even if it's these three just against the back four, if that's all we've got, I'd still take that every time in FM with these three. So I want to make sure the team is is able to play through the lines, but be direct as well. And that's what I've gone with as a sort of over, overview there. Transition, roll it out to make sure we play out from the back. Okay, counter, counter press, but this could change depending on the moment of the game. I do like to untick counter in the last 10 minutes. That's the thing that I've actually started to do recently. So we'll uh, look to do that. And it goes again with our England DNA philosophy that we're looking at. Again, we're not really trying to completely replicate that from a tactical perspective. But when we can refer back to it and use it, we will. But mainly we're looking at the player development aspect and how that's going to affect this tactic in a second. Our position, our default is to just blitz them as much as we can, but also be ready to drop. So I basically want my team to be pressing and be as intense as they can to try and win the ball back and, and engage high. But the back line, I want to be able to be intelligent enough to know when to drop and to be prepared to start low if they need to. So that's why we've got drop more, but we've also got a Libro and two cover duties. So we're trying to stay high and stay compact with the rest of the team that's pressing, but we're ready to drop as a, as a back three whenever we need to early on if, if needs be. But we could also change the defensive line for that as well. So that is your tactic, right? That is the tactic in its essence. Hopefully, I did say I'd go into it more detail later, but I went into it pretty detailed then. I won't go to player instructions now because it's not really that important and there aren't too many anyway. But now let's look at, the reason I wanted to do that now, I wanted you to understand what the player training, player-specific training was in reference to. Now we're going to go through the in-detail player training schedule it's going to be basically a schedule not really in the game but the way that we're going to do it is going to be a schedule and now it's going to make sense as to why i'm asking players to work on specific things depending on what position they play in now what we are going to do for individual training is this i am going to have a a note created in the game so every three months i'm going to change the players individual training now they're all going to be on different programs depending on what position they are right so now, the bit about the England DNA that I didn't really go into too much, but they do touch upon it, is when they talk about players being flexible in positions and systems, right? And also being comfortable on the ball. That's one that they really stress, right? So so having those two things, I think you need to be pretty much a well-rounded player to play in any position is basically the, the point they're sort of getting at. In isolated, like, you know, number fours, old school number four CDMs that go around kicking people off the pitch, you know, there's no good, of, there's no good in just being that anymore because you, you might need to play a completely different role as of you if your team does, does adjust their system later in the game based on the other parts of the DNA philosophy, right? So 
we're going to have that little bit. So what we're going to do is every three months across the year, we're going to change the individual focus, additional focus here, as it says right here, depending on what position they're playing for us. Now, I've broken it down into a few. So we're going to have goalkeeper will be one. We're not going to go onto that too much just yet. But we're going to have the middle centre-back is going to be its own role. The two side centre-backs are going to be their own role. The wing back is going to be their own role, obviously. Um, the left CDM, right CDM are going to be different. Two different roles there. The cam's going to be its own role. And then the left striker and right striker are going to be separate again. And the reason for that is because what I'm asking the left striker to do and what I'm asking the right striker to do are two completely different things. And they're going to be two completely different profiles of player. They probably both need to have a little bit of each other's qualities in them. Like if they're going to be a six at five target man, they probably still need to have a, a bit of quickness or a bit of a first touch and agility in case they are played in behind on their side. And the right striker probably needs to be at least okay at heading the ball. If he's not great in the air, it's jumping reach, for example. Um, and then looking at centre-backs. Now, ideally, the central centre-back, the middle centre-back, is going to be your organiser, better positionally, making better decisions. Doesn't need to be as fast maybe as the side ones. And, but then it goes vice versa. They probably all need to have a bit of that quality in the each. But just an example of why I've differentiated them because they're going to be on slightly different programs. But again, going back to the, the team, the team training, they're going to get bits of everything. But then we're going to really hone down on the the aspects that we need. So when we're developing our young players through the academy, when we get wingers that we're going to convert to wing back, and we know we're going to convert them, we're going to make sure that as they're learning to play wing back, they're also working on making sure that they're good at dribbling, they're good at acceleration, etc. But let's go through that now anyway, and go through the four in each one. Right, okay. I just thought I would show you this, like, on the screen, just because it'd be easier to explain, to be honest. June, effectively, when preseason starts, let's just go through them in order. So middle centre-back has got its own section there. We'll work on quickness first, just because it's, it's you know, two months of that is going to be preseason, so there's less chance if they get a little slight injury, it's going to cost them as much. A defensive position in strength and ball control in that order every every few months. Um, I think most importantly is they have to be good in the air because they're going to be often the one that gets uh, the headers from goal kicks, things like that, especially against teams with one striker system. So I think it's quite important they have that defensive positioning as well. I think it's quite important. And ball control because they might have a lot of passes to them played quite quickly and having the ability to, be able to at least just control them, pass off to somebody else is, is fine. Generally, the passing... Like the passing attribute for for the for the amount of passing they're gonna do, I don't think really matters. They're not gonna ever gonna be switching the ball like uh, like PLO, so that's fine with me. Left slash right centre back. So a slight difference here. We've got quickness again, first off, but then we've got agility into defensive positioning. I just think that it's more important for them. They're gonna get caught a lot of times, like in a hybrid situation where they're almost like uh, the ideal scenario would be like they'd have the the defensive attributes of a centre back, but the in possession attributes of an old school fullback. So it was sort of to be a halfway house between the two. So they need to be quick and they need to be agile to deal with the high level wingers they're going to be dealing with, especially towards the end of the, you know the save and where they're hopefully challenging for the league titles and stuff. Um, you imagine against the top level wingers, they need to have agility and, and pace. Basically, they just need to have that. Uh, and then defensive positioning and ball control are going to be the things we look at after that. They're also going to be the ones that travel out with it from the back a little bit as well, especially the right center back having nobody else really there in that sort of like cam area is gonna be traveling with it with the segundo balance slightly higher he's gonna a lot he's gonna have a lot of time on the wall so so wing backs there we've got quickness and agility the same as the uh the center backs there then we've got ball control coming in next because it's more important because the the last one here is like the additional one for a lot of them because obviously march april a bit of may after you get to that sort of the back end of may and, and the first start of june that's going to be when the season's over and they're not going to be training anyway. So that's sort of like the bonus one. And the bonus one there is, is crossing. Like crossing's important. This could change the wing back. I'm not entirely sure. I know these two need to be in. That one could maybe get taken out. It's just, it's the dribbling that I'm worried about. And that's what ball control affects. But so does agility. Agility can seem to affect the dribbling attribute progression as well. I've noticed in some of my, my saves previously. So that's it's important. And then crossing glass. But maybe crossing should be replacing ball control there. Left CDM, so this is by far a more defensive midfield player, and it's more important for them to be able to just get it and then pass with it. So there's no agility on this one. It's more offensive positioning first, then ball control, then passing. Lastly, strength to be good on those, those set pieces in case they are needed to, to deal with long ball in the air from goal kicks that don't quite reach the back line, but they're the next one. They're often going to be the one that's going to be... Uh, they're often going to be the one that's going to be dealing with those those like long counter-attacking balls that go to midfield. Right, CDM, so box will field player effectively, ball control, quickness, passing, attacking movement. I think that one's pretty simple. And what you'll notice here is that the cam has exactly the same ones. And the reason for that is those two positions are quite interchangeable. You can easily have like a, a 
pivot players more like a box to box of players a 10 for a few games there's injuries and suspensions also if we have a few players that are injured I'd almost rather play a number 10 back in that role than trying to play two actual out and out CDMs so that's why they're both the same but in a different order right striker is going to be your smaller pacey in behind striker so he's working on quickness then shooting then agility then quickness again he's the only player that double dips on on quickness here and the left striker strength because he needs to be good in the air absolutely essential he's got to be good in the air and he's got to be able to be good in the air in terms of winning the header rather than the header being accurate that's why strength which works on jumping reach is more important to me than actual the heading attribute uh, then shooting then agility then quickness now if he and we'll go into this now as well but if he happened to have decent shooting i'd replace that with heading to be honest with you but now we're going to get into this right so that is the template for those positions right now however let's say we have a cdm going back to the england dna stuff let's say we've got a cdm who's really good at everything here but let's say Let's say his passing's eight. He's got eight passing, but he's pretty strong. His dribbling's okay. His vision's okay. Everything's good except for passing. That's what's letting him down. So what you would do there and here is you would effectively, for his individual plan, now replace these all with just passings. He would just do passing for the whole year because clearly that's his weakness. And for him to play that role in this system, he's going to have to improve that. And that's what's holding him back. So it doesn't mean that all players will do this all the time. That is the template. And that is what we're trying to stick to generally for players. However, if they have a clear deficiency for the role they're supposed to be playing for the team, then they would go to that. So there is room to maneuver outside of this, but that's the plan we're going to use anyway. There'll be some people watching this that are going, do you know what, Joe? that sounds like a really good idea. That's really good. But what if I forget? What if I forget to do it and then it's all out of sync, etc.? How do you remember? Well, this is what you can do. Go to your notebook and make sure you create a note. I've just got change individual training in England DNA. I've just got that as the title. And we're going to select a date. And we're just going to go, first of all, select dates. And we're going to go to the first one, which is it's June to September. And we'll just go September. We'll go September 1st. Why not? And we're going to click here. Reminder every three months. So after the 1st of September, every three months, it's now going to remind us. So click confirm. So there we go. Now, every three months, you're going to get a nice reminder saying need to change your training and there you go you might miss it you know to be fair but i think generally like if 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 you know you're sort of subconsciously looking out for it because you're doing this kind of save and you've set a reminder to come through to your inbox you're probably gonna catch it you might forget by a few weeks if you do you know so well, it's all right if a few weeks out if you just happen to forget but uh yeah that's what we're gonna do anyway we're gonna make sure every few months that we change what they do i think three months is there's no reason for that it's just it seems like about right give them four different categories to work on give them enough time for that category to take a little bit of an effect I think that is probably going to end our episode there. Now, the reason for that, I think that we could go into the team as well, but I think this episode is already going to be a decent length and it's going to be in chapters so you can skip the bits that you want. We can watch all of it if you do. And if you did watch all of it, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I think next episode, what we'll do is we'll come back for the first game of the season. We'll go through the team and play the first game or two as well. And yeah, it's going to be basically until we get our first youth intake, it's going to be basically like a let's play in terms of our predictions. So the board want us to, the board want us to finish mid table. I mean, like normally when you do a save, you want to do as well as possible, as early as possible, right? I'd love for us to get promoted and be in the championship, etc. Because it's a, a youth only save, getting promoted immediately may not be the best thing for us. So we're just going to go with it and see what happens and see what happens to the team. I think we'll do okay. I think we'll do all right with the tactic. But yeah, I don't know. I'm excited about this to see how see how this goes. And I just think every year probably you just sign all the all the youth players to make sure that we have as big of a intake as possible every time around. And there's going to be interesting with this save. There's going to be times where we've got a decent team competing at a level that we that we're happy with. But there might be a youngster that comes through and we're like, oh, we need him to get good because he's he's got potential. And then we're gonna have to just throw him in and take somebody else out who's already good and just accept the fact that we're gonna take a hit on results at times. It's just going to happen, isn't it, with this kind of save? But I'm really excited about this. Like, as you can see with the stuff we've gone through, I'm sort of trying to blend a little bit of like the real life England DNA, real life coaching stuff along with foot manager. And we're just seeing what, it's like a stress test, isn't it? What can we get from foot manager? What can we apply from real life and try and apply it to the game? And what outcomes do we get? What can we do? Obviously, just like real life, there's an element of just luck, fortuna, as Machiavelli called it. There's, there's an element of certain things that we just can't control. So the players that we get through the intake, there's only so much we can do with that kind of stuff, but we'll, uh, we'll give it our best shot anyway. And yeah, I hope that I've broken that down in a way that is informative and it makes sense to you and that you're, you know, in tune with where we're going with the save. But uh, yeah, the aim for the save is going to be just to try, try and win the Premier League, try and win the Champions League. 
we're going to win the Premier League and Champions League. That's that's the aim. Is we're going to is we're going to win it, win the Premier League and Champions League, or try and get as close as we can. But I, you know, I think we could do it. I think we could do it long term. It's going to be a long term save. Now the reason for this on on YouTube and not Twitch is because, first of all, I actually want to go back to doing more YouTube stuff and having more YouTube stuff here. This is where my first platform was. I prefer to have it on YouTube in, in a lot of ways. And also I like having that sort of one-to-one -one connection, you know, like I was saying this before about, about in a, in potentially doing other games and stuff on the channel. I like having the one-to-one -one connection rather than it being in a, in, a, in a stream and I have the chat there and you hear me talking to, I don't want any of that. I want this just to be me and you watching and there's nobody else, right? Um, and hopefully we can go along this journey together and you'll be a part of this and you can see where I go right, where I go wrong. But I think that's going to do it. I think we'll go through all the other little parts about preseason training and that kind of stuff at, uh, at another point. I, I think this episode is going to be long enough, but I don't want to go into absolutely everything now because I think I've covered the bits that I wanted to cover in a lot of detail and I'm happy with that. That's how I'd want it to be. And we'll try and get some coaches in that have all got similar um, like personalities and stuff to try and get the youth players through in the same sort of style so we'll go through that as well i'll go through that in the next episode because that'll be something else to look at so next episode we'll go through the players we've actually got we'll go through the coaches that we've signed why i've signed these specific coaches and what we're trying to create in terms of the staff we'll go through the staff and stuff that leaves us something to talk about in the uh in the next one i've got to be honest with you this series and the money ball series that i'm going to start soon are probably going to take us through the whole rest of the fm23 cycle so hopefully this is something a little bit different for you and if you've got any thoughts about whether you want me to do more like bring some more of the real life coaching stuff into the episodes or, or less whichever way you, you you think do let me know in the comments uh, your feedback and that's got absolutely nothing to do with trying to get some artificial traffic on the comment section to try and boost it up in the algorithm it's got nothing to do with that i generally want to know what you think about bringing like england dna the real life stuff over does that interest you as an fm viewer like a lot of people here will be fm players not necessarily too bothered about coaching or real life stuff but uh, if you did like that please let me know and if you didn't or you want to see more or less let me know obviously it's not going to be every episode like this because this was the this was the introductory episode as it were into the into the series and, and how things are going to work but but that's going to do it thank you very very much for watching the episode and i really hope you do enjoy this series um, i'm so excited for this i can't wait to see how it goes uh i don't know how it's going to go which i think excites me even more because i've never done this kind of save before and we brought so much real life stuff to it i have no idea how the series is going to go in terms of how we do I have no idea how it's going to do in terms of views. Absolutely love it. Thank you for watching and I'll see you all next time.